your bread upon the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. You ever hear that phrase before? Cast your bread upon the waters. I'll tell you, I've heard it countless times. Years ago, I was part of our participated in a men's Bible study. And it was way out in the West End, and we would meet, I think it was on Tuesday, I can't it was Tuesday or Thursday, it's been a while, but it's 6.30 in the morning, and we would meet out there, and, uh, and Judy just, oh. So, I mean, it was a wonderful time of Christian fellowship, and a time of Bible study, and a time of prayer, but there was this one fellow that was there, and he must have loved this passage. Because I think almost every single week, somehow or another, he would work it into the conversation or discussion. You know, it didn't matter what we were talking about. You know, being ransomed. Well, yeah, you know, you got to cast your bread on the water. <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly certain that he knew what this passage means. And I'm pretty sure he didn't know how it was being used in the Bible and how it's being used here in the book of Ecclesiastes. Because if you start off just at face value, it doesn't seem to make any sense. Think about it. You go out to the a creek or a river or a lake and you take a whole bunch of pieces of bread and you toss them out there in the water. And there they go floating on. What do you have? Mush. Mush. Soggy bread. That's all you Soggy bread. And then this bread takes on the water, gets heavy, it sinks to the bottom, that's if the birds and the fish don't eat it first, and then it goes on to say, and in many days you can go back and get it. Good luck with that. So, clearly this is not talking about the literal throwing out of chunks of bread and having it float there and being available for you to retrieve it at a later time. As a matter of fact, that word in many days in, in the Hebrew, that word days doesn't necessarily mean a, a literal 24-hour period. It can mean weeks or months or years. Yeah, a couple years later, go back and find that bread. And you can get it back again. So, it can't mean, can't have that literal meaning, which then opens up, so what the heck does it mean if it doesn't literally mean to throw bread on the water? Well, I'm going to tell you, this could very well be as the introduction to the chapter 11, of Ecclesiastes, but it could very well be the introduction to a class in financial economics. The first six verses in Ecclesiastes 11 is about making sound investments that will produce an abundant ROI, return on investment. And he's going to use, Solomon's going to use agriculture and commodities exchanges to make his point. Because people would understand that. So if you have your Bible, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, first six verses. Ecclesiastes 11. Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven, or, or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. If the clouds are full, they will pour out rain on the earth. And whether a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know the path of the wind or how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Sow your seed in the morning, and do not be idle in the evening. For you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. That's almost as clear as throwing that bread in the water, isn't it? <laughs> so many times in the Bible, examples are used from the events and things that you would easily understand from normal activities, and then you can take those things and apply them, because even though our activities, we don't dwell a lot about planting and sowing and harvesting crops, but yet we understand the principles that are behind them. And so he's using these examples to teach us some principles. And he starts off by using what is that, that casting your bread on the waters as a reference to shipping out grains all over the world 
and they take those grains to other countries and use the grains to barter and buy stuff and bring it back. So he's talking about casting your bread on the water. He's like, get you all your grains, collect all the stuff that you've harvested, and if you can't eat it all, keep what you need, but then sell the rest of it. Go down and load it on the ships and send it off, and when you do that, they'll come, those ships will come back, and they'll have a bunch of other stuff that, you know, you got a bunch of grain, you need clothing, you need this, you need, and he says, so you can get stuff back. It's your way of investing. So he uses shipping terms. And he tells us that not only are we supposed to properly invest our time and our talents and our abilities and even the opportunities that God gives us, but if we do it properly, we will get a wonderful, abundant return on the investment. So casting out your grains is referencing sending out ships. And we know from reading other places in Scripture, particularly uh, in 1 Kings, when he's talking about all the stuff that Solomon had, at one point in the 10th chapter, it talks about him, it says he had a fleet of ships, ships. he had a, a navy of ships out, and he calls them, they were the ships of Tarshish, and he had another fleet of ships, those were the ones of Hero. So not only did he have one whole fleet, he had two whole fleets to load Remember, back then they didn't use them for war. They used them for commerce. And he's loading them things up. And the Bible says in that passage in 1022, that was the passage, every time they would send all these ships out, and they would be gone for three years because they're going all over the world. And then when they came back, he said they would come back, and they would just be loaded with gold and silver and ivory. And said, and everything from apes to peacocks. I mean, they bought everything when they were out, and they brought it back. But it was an investment. You load all your stuff in the ships, you cast them out on the water, and then you got to wait. And after three years, they all come back, and they got all the goodies on them. What a return. Gold, silver, ivory. And so I'm saying, we need to live our lives just like that. And he starts off by saying, you know, don't just have one ship, but you've got to have a bunch of ships. And the reason for that, why did they not just send out one? Well, I'm going to tell you, shipping, well, that was a pretty risky endeavor in that day. Storms, huge storms. They tried not to travel during particular times of the year, but it was still never a, a guarantee. Or a ship could run aground. Or simply they're old, they're wooden. Sometimes they just fell apart. So you sent a bunch of them out. Because if you just sent one and it went down, you'd lose all the grain and nothing in return. So he says, cast out your bread on many waters. That way it helps to ensure that you will get something back. That, that, that the, the amount that comes back will be much greater than any ship that you might possibly lose. That's a call for us as Christians to invest all that God gives us and to take it and to use it in the world. Because we don't know what it is that we use that God will then turn around and use for His kingdom and His glory. It's just you got to share it. That's why in verse 2, remember it says right there, it is Oh, uh, I lost it. Divide your portion to seven or even eight. Number seven in the Bible, that's the number of absolute perfection. Remember in the passage, I think it was in uh, Matthew, when Peter says, well, you know, what do you want me to do? Forgive somebody seven times? He thought that was the perfect amount. That would be the absolute max. Remember what the Lord told him? No, 70 times seven. So here he's going, you need, to, you need to send your stuff out. You need to live your life. You need to invest and with other people. He said, don't just figure seven. That's the, two. That would be a, that's the maximum amount that I'm going to invest in other people. Seven. And I don't want to be here. No. Make it eight. Go above and beyond what you think is the maximum amount. Hit as many ports as you possibly can when you're sharing the love and the grace of God with the world. Because you never know who and which person that you come in contact with that you're sharing that what you offer will be receptive and what will be well received. 
who's going to desire what it is that you're bringing to the poor? And he said, but don't expect just because you're going to a bunch of ports and you have really good stuff. You may have the best grain in the world. You may have the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may have the love of God. Don't expect that just because you have good cargo that you're not going to run into some problems and obstacles along the way. Verse 2, it says, you know, it talks about the clouds just fill up with rain and it's just torrential downpour. Yeah, that's going to happen. And it doesn't matter whether a tree falls this way or this way. If it falls across the road, it's still across the road. You can't get by it. How do you get your cart past the tree that's down? He said, you need to expect that there's going to be obstacles. And he uses torrential rains and fallen trees to make that point. Don't let the fact that when you go out to share the love of God with other people, the fact that you're going to have obstacles along the way, and it's not going to go the way that you plan, and it's going to be hard, do not let that affect the fact that you're still supposed to go and do it. God has called you to do that. He has basically loaded you up and sent you out. And verse 3 says, then you need to make sure you do it. I love the example that he's talking about somebody sitting around just worrying about looking for the perfect time, the perfect day. And here he's talking about a plant. Somebody's got a plant. You know, you've got to get your seeds and stuff in the ground at a certain time of year, or else you're not getting anything out of the other time of the year. Carl will know. Carl's our farmer here. He knows all about packing and sowing and reaping. He said, if you're going to sit at home on your sofa and look at the weather channel every day, and go, oh, I don't know, might be a little too wet. Next day, eh, too hot. No, up too windy, too cold, too humid, too blustery. Too... If every day, if you're waiting for the perfect opportunity to sow, tell you what's going to happen. You will never sow anything. You never sow anything, you won't reap anything either. If you're constantly waiting for just the right time and circumstance, just everything has to line just right in order to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with someone. I've been thinking about it, but you know the time just isn't right. I mean, if you said that, well, I would like, yeah, it just didn't seem like the right time. Is the next day the right time? Is the next day? If you're always waiting for just the right time to share the gospel, if you're always waiting for just the right time to, to give somebody a helping hand, ah, I'm a little too busy. I just can't make time. Looking for just the right time to make a donation to a worthy cause. You're looking for just the right time to decide to repent of a certain sin. You're waiting for just the right time to start tithing to the Lord. The right time to start surrendering your life to God. If you're waiting for the right time, folks, you're going to die waiting. And there will be no planting. And there will be no reaping. So what is it that we're supposed to be investing? What is it we're supposed to be out planting? And what is it that we hope to gain from? Let me just suggest a couple of practical examples of what it is we should be investing in. First thing deals with physical, our bodies. We need to invest wisely in our bodies. You know, we can't know and we can't change all the things that happen. Sicknesses and illnesses and diseases. We can't control everything. But folks, there are some things we can address. There are some ways that we can invest in our bodies so that we get a return. You know, there are millions and millions of people that suffer from all sorts of physical calamities that they bring upon themselves because of diet, drugs, alcohol abuses, there was a, a documentary on the other day on flipping channels, and I, I, I always like John Wayne movies. So when I went by, it was some John Wayne thing, but it was just talking about his life. I saw about five minutes of it, but it was talking about the fact that he smoked six packs of cigarettes a day. Oh my goodness. Six! And somebody that interviewed said he only lit one batch a day. Because as he finished one cigarette, he lit the other one off of him. 
lost one lung because of lung cancer. And three weeks after he got out of the hospital, he was back to smoking six packs again a day. Folks, we, we can invest in our bodies. I'm not saying we'll live forever, but I'm going to tell you what, we don't need to be adding to the problems. God has called us to be a light, to reach out to the world. Don't damage the cargo ship. No kind of investment it has to do with our relationships. How we interact, how we deal with other people. You know, God is a God of relations. That's why we have a trinity. He's always had a relationship, even with himself. The Son, the Father, the Holy Spirit. And he created us. He said, I'm on, let's make man like us. So that we would have relationships with God and with each other. As we walk through this brief life, we have opportunities to invest our lives in other people. And this can relate to our families. Too many families are all, they're split apart, they drift apart because some silly feud, which was very serious at the time, evidently, or jealousies, or contentious remarks, <coughs> All of this really just deals with selfishness. I'm right, you're wrong, I don't have no parts of it. And it's not only in our natural families, but too often it's in our church families too. You know, some people who would not sit on this side because so and so is there. <laughs> they gotta sit on that. That's not, I'm not saying you. But a lot of y'all sit on the opposite side of our net, and I'm not really sure why. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, churches are the worst. That's the place where everybody ought to get along, isn't it? Yeah. Love each other, overlook each other's faults. If Lord Jesus Christ will overlook my faults, I ought to be able to overlook somebody else's. But yet, we don't invest ourselves in the fam our own families in the way we should, and in our church families. Making ourselves available to care and to love and to pray and to service and help one another. That's why the Lord gave us the church. He made us a part of the church. He left us here for that purpose. To be part of His church. Not only to share the gospel outside, but also to, for us to care for one another inside. And we heard some examples from people who spoke today of how much it meant to them to have a loving, caring family that is the church. Because if we're not going to invest in our relationships, if we're not going to go there and do that, then what happens is they were sitting all alone at home wondering why nobody has come to see us and why nobody really cares about me. Get up. You've separated yourself off and you're wondering why there's no relationship. You know, when we invest our time and ourselves and the love of Christ with the people who live around us, whether it's in our family, our church family, or people in our work, our next door neighbor, whatever it is, the return on that is more than we will ever be able to know or measure. That's why in verse 5 it says, even though we don't know how it's all working when we invest that way, when we cast our bread out and, and there's a return down the road, and we don't know whether it's days, months, or years, but when we are serious about doing that, he said, we might know, not know how it's all working, but he said, but God is using it. It's God is working all of that out. And he is going to reap great rewards and benefits for his kingdom and for his glory third practical way that we can invest is through sowing. That's with an O, not an E. Sowing in our spiritual life. Investing our time in the faithful study of God's Word. You know, God's Word is the way that He tells us about Himself. We tend to make up a lot of things that we tend to make God more like us, just like a glorified man too often. But God says, 
I'm not a man. I'm nothing like a man. The faithful study of his word and what he teaches us about himself and he teaches us about ourselves and he teaches us about our relationship with him and he teaches us that, that faithful study the way that we invest our time in that kind of a study. We invest our time in coming together as we are here today as a holy family, a priesthood, a church, investing our time to commit ourselves to pray for one another and serve one another. All of this, these investments that we make spiritually will reap great returns, a great bounty from our of harvest. So we're called according to Ecclesiastes to invest all of those little types of pieces of bread that we just talked about. We're going to take those things and to cast them out. To spread them far and wide. Don't be stingy. Share it with seven. The maximum amount. Now I tell you what. You just go a little further than that. And share it even more. And more. And more. And when you do that. You will begin to build a, a, a maturity in your faith. A, a devotion to a Christ-like walk and a peaceful holiness as we spend our days in close communion with each other and with God. So all of these types of investments, physical, social, relational, <coughs> spiritual, as we invest our lives, God has promised there will be great reward. And no reward for those who refuse to. But he's telling us, don't be dissuaded just because there's obstacles. He told you in advance there will be. And don't be tempted to, to put off planting and sowing, hoping that things will be better tomorrow. Tomorrow might be more difficult. And to never be lazy or half-hearted in our efforts. Not everything that we work to plant or every endeavor that we want to invest in is guaranteed to produce the return that we hope for. Because an act of a Christian towards somebody else may not be received kindly. It may not be welcomed. It might even be rejected. But you still have to cast the breads out on the water. That's why we're told to cast many. And to keep on investing of our time. Keep on investing our compassion towards others. Keep on offering and giving our assistance to those in need. Because everything that God has given to us, every blessing that you receive, God means for us to use it. To plant for a great harvest that is to come. Because the growing season is brief. So if you want to invest your life, I told you this was like a, a financial study. If you want to invest your life according to what God has given us here, is this, this class in the, uh, commodity ec uh, ec economics. If you want to invest that will have the greatest rate of return and the greatest profit, be generous. Seek and serve as many people as you possibly can. Cast your many breaths so they'll hit as many ports as possible. And don't procrastinate. Waiting for the right time will just cause you to miss the right time and make the wrong decision. And don't be dismayed if there's obstacles. You know, sometimes the hardest ground will produce the sweetest fruit. And be persistent. Keep at it. The 
tense of the verb there is to keep casting out your bread. Keep throwing out and keep waiting in many days, days, weeks, months, years. It'll all produce fruit, but you got to keep sowing. Solomon knew the formula for wise investing. That's why he'd send out a whole bunch of vessels of grain. And then he would patiently wait because the return was pretty darn valuable when it got back. In our Lord's Prayer, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. So that we can cast it out for and to others. And then wait to see the rich reward with what God will do. We know the way to invest wisely as a Christian. We're just supposed to load up the love and the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ and ship it out in, in as many places as we can get it to. One day, we'll see how God was working with all of those pieces of bread to fill His kingdom with the glorious return on the investment that we made. Cast your bread and wait because you will receive it back. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Lord God, thank you. Lord, as we read through Ecclesiastes, there's been so many lessons there on what it is to be a wise person, living according to your word and your will, and what it is to be a fool, which is living according to the way that our, our, our bodies, our minds, our natural bodies would say living according to the flesh. And today, our lesson was no different. That we need to invest our time, our hearts, our love, our compassion, to invest those and spread those to as many people as we can so they might know the love and the grace and all the wonderful blessings that we receive as we share them with others. Teach us, Lord, each day not to be stingy, not to be timid, not to be shy, and not to put off what we need to do. Give us strength, give us boldness, and equip us that we might spread the bread, the very bread of life, upon many waters.
Join in the battle.